me. This place cleans up okay. 7428 Studio has flipped because Wednesday we got the James E. Sullivan Awards, the AAU James E. Sullivan Awards. We're hosting it. Crazy town. Thought you might like to see it. Okay. You know, we got Wesley King today, so we got a great conversation coming up. Mm, let's get going. Coming to you live from Los Angeles, it's the top-rated show in the Sentinella Adobe Corridor. Operating in the shadow of LAX, out of the 7428 studio, where Jimbo is at the controls and Buck takes a nap until he's got to take a crap. It's Facebook Live at 5. Hi, everybody. Christine here. I'm here to tell you where to find us on social media. So if you can remember these three phrases, you can find us anywhere. The first, Sports Stories Podcast. The second, Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. That's Denny like the restaurant, Lennon like the beetle. Or Sports Stories DL. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. We're on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and of course here on Facebook. Like us. Subscribe. If you had a podcast, we'd like you and we'd subscribe to you. I'm a Venice, California-born, Los Angeles-based sports fan, one that has played, coached, announced, and promoted sports my whole life. My love affair with sports started in my own backyard and has led me to this podcast. Thanks to the support of the Amateur Athletic Union in East Bay, I'm excited to bring you Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. Bomb going. Let's start again. We start. No, it says the mic is muted. It's on on my side. Okay, just live, live shenanigans. You're Keep going, director. My director, Christine Jimbo. Okay, good. Hey, uh, top five states. We always go over that outside of California, of course, because California is still leading the rankings by far. But guess who cracked the top five outside of California? Nova Scotia. Go figure. Okay, we got Oklahoma's in the house, Oregon, go Ducks, Florida, and OH. I know. They're always here. They're always holding on to that number two spot. Okay. We also got a shout out to our New York Athletic Club. It's the reason I'm wearing the shirt. That's where we were, uh, previous AAU Sullivan Awards. They do an awesome job of hosting these ceremonies, like dynamite job, and we're going to miss being there. Because of these circumstances, we're going to make the best of these circumstances with our Wednesday show. So uh, shout out to, to all the frontline workers. We know New York is wearing it. So come on, New York. Keep coming. And the rest of us, hey, we got to stay together. we got to stay together. And we will. All right. Speaking of them, their Sullivan Awards, how about we look at a little video and then we bring in our guest, Wesley King.
Right, right. We're hosting the AAU James E. Sullivan Awards. Sick. The mic's not muted, is it? Because it's showing me that. It says you your tell, mic is you muted. Tell them about Catherine Plummer and Trevor Lawrence. And no, I don't want to tell them about that. Right, but it does say my mic's muted on my screen. Um, so maybe Wesley can hear me. Hey, Wesley, what you doing? Bring it on in. We're bringing him in. All right. This is our best New York Times best selling author, the Wizenard series, in addition to many others that we'll talk about. But let's see if we can bring in Wesley King. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Then that means our peoples can hear us. This is good. Hi, Wesley. Beautiful. How you doing? What's it like up in Nova Scotia? It's uh, miserable and, and cold. It's uh... About two degrees Celsius. I'm trying to do some quick math in my head Fahrenheit. Mm. That would, um, okay. That would explain my ratings are up in Nova Scotia. <laughs> that means people are inside and they're forced to watch. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So did you hear my shout out to all the states? And did you hear how Nova Scotia cracked the top five? No, I didn't hear that. I was cutting out. What happened then? Yeah. So yeah, they did. You know, I call out all the states where we got our most uh, people listening. And Nova Scotia cracked in there. You must have a little play. Nova Scotia, all right. Yeah. I don't know if it's really a state. I just kind of went with that. Province, same idea. Province, okay. Yeah. Um, 33 years old, Wesley. We went over this Friday night show. And um, I think I asked you the same question. When are you going to get started on your career? <laughs> yeah, hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you um, – not everybody watches on the same um, nights. So, you know, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Sure. Maybe uh, we go over – but um, give us an idea, like where you're born in, in uh, elementary school and that kind of stuff, how you grew up. Yeah, so I grew up just outside of uh, Toronto, uh, which would probably be maybe the most familiar Canadian city to the American mm -hmm. viewers, I would suspect. So lifelong uh, Blue Jays, Toronto Maple Leafs and Toronto Raptors fan, um, diehard Toronto Raptors fan, uh, but, but grew up watching all of them. You know, remember the uh, quite fondly, I was at the 93 um world series game winning you know so oh wow uh, that was the those are the glory days of toronto sports until last year when the raptors of course uh ended our long long streak but uh yeah and then i grew up there and and then um really developed a love for sailing i bought a um 1967 one-off sailboat to try and circumnavigate the world which is on pause of course at the moment but but that's the plan and i moved out to nova scotia to also facilitate that and live on the water Oh, beautiful. Um, I know you went to, um, where was the junior high? Because when you, the other night we had on uh, Tim Leary, who, right. is, uh, who showed off his, uh, his World Series ring, and you came strong with your three uh, Athlete of the Year awards. Were those from uh, junior high or from high school? High school. Yeah. So four I four did, years? Uh, it was a four-year program, yeah, and I, and I did uh, took three of them. So What happened to that other year? That was a down year. It was... Uh, <laughs> You know, I was grade 11. I think that's when I started indulging in some other, um, you know, <laughs> pleasures of the flesh, I guess. Yeah. That, that gets, that gets the best of us. Yeah. That's All right. Yeah. Um, and what were your, what were your sports again? Uh, so I played a, a ton of sports. Um, I played obviously basketball, of course, Canadian. So I was playing hockey mm -hmm. um, and then rugby. And then I was actually my main sport in which I was going to play collegially in the States for was as a soccer goalkeeper. That was my sort of premier sport there. And, um, eventually went into writing instead, instead of following that pursuit down to, uh, was headed down to Arizona, which I do regret sometimes hmm. not going to Arizona, but, uh, uh, the writing has been, been kind to me of late too. So I suppose that it paid off. It's a pretty strict curriculum at Arizona state there. So I don't know, you know, if you would have cut it, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you did go to uh, Carrollton university and that's in Ottawa. Yes, yes, that is, and that's, uh, and they are the the best basketball school up there. But uh, I couldn't cut it there either because again, I just, you know, they're very much they practice three times a day, seven days a week, right? Um, and if, you know, unfortunately, Canadians don't send a lot of players collegiately to the NBA or anywhere from there. They're either sort of picked right out of high school. Generally, they go down to a U.S. prep school. Andrew Wiggins, these kind of guys. So, mm -hmm. Canadian collegiate sports are for fun. Is is really more so a little bit what they are. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, when you were uh, when you're coming up, who um, I always like to ask this uh, of my guests because you know it's important. Was there a certain like a mentor 
or maybe a teacher or professor that kind of took an interest in you and, and helped point you in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, an absolute ton of them, both both in the writing and the sports side. You know, we had uh, great coaches and, and, and one of the great, you know, it's tough to be a coach, I think, for a team that you know is not going to win and that you know probably is never going to win. And, and so to have that coach who comes in and, and still pushes you to just be the best. And we had a coach yeah. like that through our, our team. You know, we were playing in the Toronto area and we were from sort of a – more of a suburban area playing against uh, downtown Toronto. But, you know, Corey Joseph was like the, you know, the, the point guard on the team. So we were getting beat up all the time in these types of sports, but he really instilled this sort of central love of the game and the philosophy of the game, um, which now all these years later has really come back into the Wizenark series, this, this love for the, the heart of sports with the camaraderie, the teamwork, that kind of stuff. That's what he taught us. So yeah, uh, yeah. This is like an homage to that, that I get to do now. Yeah, it, it, it does. It plays out as that. Um, I know that um, you were a big like when you're little or at least I read uh, that when you're little, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was your thing. You eventually moved on to Star Wars. And so you're always attracted to, um, you know, those kind those kind of uh, stories. And do you do you remember um, what, what kind of brought you into that that realm? Yeah, I mean, definitely that magical side. When I was growing up as a kid, um, I, you know, and I wrote a book about this, but I had severe obsessive compulsive disorder, undiagnosed, and that I didn't know, you know, I had no explanation for what was happening. Um, so that was very defining in the first, you know, 20 years of my life with no explanation of what was happening. So I turned to books into writing as sort of an escapist um, sort of philosophy that, that I carried right through. And that's why I still love writing stories, because it was a way to get out of that world and get to somewhere where you had control, especially when it comes to writing. Uh, for all those writers out there it's, it's a place where you have full control of what's happening and that was important to a kid with with ocd and for people with anxiety in general depression writing is a great cathartic exercise for that yeah you'd mentioned like there wasn't a whole lot of um books or or, or, or you know cur or curriculum out there that addressed that issue yeah. with young people you know especially people like in your junior high and, and high school years yeah, and, and I initially got pushback when I put out OCD Daniel because it's middle grade, so it's picking up, but it's a very honest OCD, um, and there's such a stigma around OCD. A lot of people think if I'm clean, if I'm organized, I have OCD. This was a true look into how detrimental this is and, and what anxiety disorders look like, and I have another book coming out in June, uh, which is a prequel to that novel, which again deals with, with mental illness and kids because this is when it happens, and I really want kids... To identify that and you know I, it's been great it's been translated around the world i get letters from kids in japan kids from brazil kids in germany who see themselves in that story uh, so that's the best thing you can ask for as a writer yeah i would bet um i bet getting those do you um do you correct the uh letters like grammar or anything and send them back or <laughs> never <laughs> never uh, uh you know because that would be very hypocritical because uh, <laughs> authors make a, a ton of mistakes thank goodness we got 10 editors to uh, cover up our mistakes so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the, now, was that the Vindico series? Is that the one you're talking about or, or, that you originally? Because I think that was the first one where you really, you know, you really got into the the public eye. Yeah. So the Vindico was my first ever series, and that was a uh, a series about teen supervillains. Um, and then later on, OC Daniel was the one that addressed obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, I put out my eleventh book um, this this year. So if uh, um, wow. I've gone through with with many ups and downs along the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it sounds like a lot of ups. Um, I also, I think, um, what did I see that? I think there was one interview you did, and you talked about the Tale of Two Cities, Dickens, being an influence on you. And in particular, was that last line that you kind of mm. like you liked. And, and I was wondering, you know, how a, a novel like that, which you know most people know of. Um, but it, most people know of it from its opening line and its closing line. Right, and right. I was wondering if, if that was like an influence on you on how you, you want to write your novels. Yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite endings of all time and, and sort of the ending we aspire to, this this sort of self, self-sacrificial moment and, and an ending that you literally just say, oh, and you don't even need to read on it. And that was perfectly done. Um, I was a bit lucky, you know, in retrospect growing up that my parents just weren't really buying me kids' books. They were just giving me the books they were reading. So like mm. at six years old, I read Shogun um, and like, you know, if, wow. for those who have read Shogun, it's just all sex and violence and, and you know, a lot of other. So 
I was really plunged into adult literature and 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 grew to love it from there. And so all those types of books um, resonated. But I'm I'm happy now that kids' books are becoming so popular. Uh, you know, if you look, if you go to the Amazon top 100 right now, it's kids' books. You know, kids yeah. are at home; they, they're getting them reading. Kids' books are big right now, and it's it's great because uh, we need some. You know, it gives parents maybe a little tiny break too to give them a good book. I hope because you know those poor souls at home with their kids right now. Well, my, my kids are, you know, 28, 25 or whatever, mm -hmm. but, you know, I certainly remember how, you know, laboring through some, some children, but like we used to have to do with animated films or whatever it might be. But then when Disney and Pixar kind of came around, you know, films like Toy Story or whatever, mm -hmm. they, they were super entertaining for adults too. And that's the way I felt when I went through um, Wizenard, which I went through season one. I, I hadn't, I, I'm familiar with training camp. I didn't read that one, but um, that's the way I felt like I, I didn't need a kid around to enjoy that book. No, and, and that's definitely the case. You know, in, in season one and the Wizard Art series in general, um, it's very uh, sort of psychological. It's addressing sort of this value system that Kobe had and, and that I that I shared. Um, so it's written for kids, but I think that, you know, we're all, you know, it's got the kids at heart kind of mentality too, where it's the themes that we can all relate to and hopefully learn from. Yeah, there's, there's a... It's interesting how much, and, and for those that don't know, um, I, we should reset that Kobe was a creator of this series and then that you were the author. So um, while, I mean, I think he collaborated overall, but that was who, how, how the credits were laid out. And mm -hmm. when you when you go through that Wizenard um, book, I, I you know, knowing Kobe because his whole professional career was here in Los Angeles, right in my wheelhouse, it's it sounds so much like him, like him and how he breaks down the game of basketball. What... You, so you didn't dumb it down. You just you made it you just made it you know understandable for everybody. Yeah, that was exactly the challenge. We were taking these high level concepts, and Kobe had been become a master at this through his second life as a coach. Um, you know, and all his work with uh, with his daughter's team through the Mamba Academy, he had really sort of taken these NBA level fundamentals and brought them down in, into a you know a more accessible way. And now our challenge was to make them magical as well. Um, so we were putting this, these magical elements, you know, Kobe would call me up and say, you know, listen, um, maybe Reggie, you know, sucks at corner threes. How can we get him to shoot corner threes? So then I would come up with a magical way to push him into these areas. Um, you know, certain things, certain elements in the spotlight offense, you know, sort of this game, um, sort of Golden State style offense. How do we make a magical element? So we li literally bring spotlights in and these shadows chasing them. So it was always a way to try and bring these sort of basketball fundamentals uh, but this this fun, thrilling magic side, too, for kids who weren't into basketball and, and who more so we just wanted to impart the, the values of the game to. I also felt like there was a values of uh, imagination and, and what a role that plays in a young person's life. Um, because I think you, you probably did it. I did it. I've interviewed other guests who did the same thing all by yourself in your backyard. And you make up games where, you know, you hit or don't hit the winning shot and all of that. But it was at a much higher level where the grano was a self-reflection, where there's these forces, your shadow, whatever it might be that was working against you, yes. but then deftly pulling in things like the parrot on the head or the sandbag. And it was so cool because as a coach, you know, a longtime basketball coach, those were really good basketball principles. And they were being told through this way that was magical and entertaining. Exactly. And, and training camp is, is that to the, the nth degree because – not only are we doing these magical drills, but then we are retelling the story five times through five different perspectives. So you're also learning how each kid actually approaches the drill, how they see the other ones at the same time. So we wanted to really challenge readers to, to put themselves in their teammates' shoes as well and, and, and learn about perspective in a sense. So, you know, there's this one drill where there's this castle they have to climb um, through. The, and the whole sort of methodology is about body movements and defensive stances. Um, but it's also um, this sort of culminating moment of bringing this team together. And so how does the star take it versus the bench player and all these things? So all of this, there were sort of layers on layers on layers. And many times I said to Kobe, I said, you know, we, maybe we're getting a little aggressive. Maybe this is getting a little metaphysical, a little existential. You know, he's a, he's a Phil Jackson guy to the, to the core, too. Uh, but he wanted to keep pushing it. And so we did. And, you know, the response has been great. Um, so as per usual, uh, kids are a hundred times ahead of what we think and, and they're absorbing this and taking it in and writing these, you know, beautiful letters in response to the book. 
there, there's a few things I took from, um, from the training camp on, and, and, and some of the maxims, um, would be like, mm. it's okay to make mistakes, how to control your emotions, setting, achieving goals, success requires hard work, respect everyone, focus on what you can control. I'm a huge John Wooden guy growing up. Um, I was born the first year at UCLA won a national championship. And, you know, and by the time I was six or whatever, I just love me some Bill Walton. And I, I followed, you know, Lou Alcindor into Kareem Abdul-Jabbar because I knew he was from UCLA. I followed all the UCLA players. Love the John Wooden stuff. That all of those are really are so much of John Wooden's maxims and philosophy that come yes. from his upbringing in the Midwest. Right. And it speaks so much to doing what you can control, a person of character, that effort. And it really came through in this book. And I was wondering, you know, what coaches influenced your writing and Kobe's writing? Yeah. So, and, and Kobe, of, yeah, John Wooden was a big influence on him as well. Um, and then, of course, we had, the, you know, the Phil Jackson for so many different reasons, but also this this focus on mindfulness. You know, the players, uh, in these, they spend time just staring at a plant and watching it grow. There was a lot of mindfulness exercises and and meditation things of which Kobe was a huge um, art and proponent of as well, visualization, things like that. So he was bringing in all these elements from his coaches. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, sort of packaging these high level things with me. And then we would sit and we would hash out um, again, how to, how to, the role of be wizard that the sort of, he's the, the magical coach of the series yeah. and he's a bit of a, a concoction, a bit of a mishmash of all of these coaches and of Kobe himself. And, and so he's sort of this wise character spouting this out, uh, whereas the kids are perhaps the real world kids. And, and to get that authentic voice, you know, I went to inner city Philly and to Camden, New Jersey, and I met with these kids in AAU programs, kids from heavily, um, so, so from impoverished areas, high levels of incarceration. Uh, this one team I was with, a lot of their parents, there was not, you know, there was not two parents at home. And so we got a real authentic look at what their voices were like, so that it wasn't just sort of this, you know, throwing out um, these sort of values to these eager young kids, because there would be pushback. You can't just tell, as you, as you know, a coach yourself, um, every kid takes these things differently. And, and we wanted to reflect that and make this authentic. You did. Um, you, you really did. And it wasn't... Um... You know, I'm a big fan of uh, 70s and 80s um, terrible uh, television, like, uh, you know, like series and episodic television. I just love that. Yeah. stuff. But I look for the inherent or the uh, passive aggressive kind of racism or socialism that kind of comes through in those where they mm, try to wrap up a, a, a kid's life all in one episode. And and so I, I imagine as an author, you know, you're tempted with that. But it never came through like that. It came through as authentic. It came through as a challenge, what they were growing up in, their social environment and what, what he understood. How much of like what's going on now um, in society influenced the civilization or the society you created, uh, especially in, in season one? Yeah, so I mean, season one was completed um, last, you know, last year and sort of uh, completed around October, November. Um, and, and, you know, we, we never could have, for so many reasons, as I'm sure everyone can sort of fill in the blanks, in the world that we were facing then is, is so inf infinitely different than the one now. Um, now, season one, I guess fortuitously in a sense, does address this because that's a story about a kid who's in isolation and the things that he's doing with himself. Uh, because, you know, now we're quite physically isolated, but with Reggie's story, we were addressing a kid who was self-isolating, as so many of us do. When we start to question our values, what do we do? We isolate ourselves. We push people away so that we can't be rejected. And, and that's Reggie's story. Um, yeah. So his story is about how do I redefine myself as somebody who's worth it? And, and Kobe's answer, you know, as it was for so many things in his life, was put in the work. You know, yeah. put the practice in. Earn your self-respect. And that's what he does throughout this book. Reggie, finally, uh, he, he works and he works and he faces all these challenges and then, and then his teammates got his back, and and they 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 all come together and they push the coach to in, inject him into the starting lineup. Which I love that this is a story about a kid that works his way from the bench to the starting lineup. It's brilliant. Yes. But he finally gets into that starting lineup, and um, 
and they, they tell this to the coach who's, who's a taskmaster. He's a disciplinarian. And then he says, okay. And he makes him run laps and Reggie doesn't know whether to be nervous or not about it. He just says, I just know right now I get to do the work of running laps. And I thought that was like, that's so Kobe. It's like, yes. it's like right now, right in front of me is the work. And this is, this is the good part. Exactly. And, you know, Kobe was always focused on the process and, and, you know, for those, I mean, it's, it's funny now I'm living, you know, I'm watching the parallels with the last dance, which is out now, of course, on Netflix and, and watching mm -hmm. Michael Jordan's story. And I'm, there's so many parallels in their philosophies, this, this getting down to work mentality, but, but Kobe and I both had a great appreciation for the road and, and, and the road being, can we appreciate the road on the way to our goals? Um, because whatever happens at the end, as long as you appreciate the road, then it's all worth it. It's going to lead you to where you're supposed to be. So that became this really um, eminent theme throughout these stories. And we had not planned season one. We wrote training camp. I think about halfway through, we both sort of found out that we really were connecting with Reggie. He was just sort of this bench player. And we just sort of, you know, one day sort of looked at each other essentially and said, let's write Reggie's story. Let's dive into season one. And I'm so glad we did because this is the story. This is the Kobe story of the kid who just works his butt off and, and finds meaning throughout of it. And, you know, our books don't necessarily end with them killing a bad guy or with winning a championship, hoisting a trophy. It's this sort of internal journey. Um, mm -hmm. And it goes in, in gradual steps because that more so reflects what we actually experience. Yeah, it, it is. It's so true. Um, Wesley, I'm going to ask you to stay after we go to these breaks. Of but one of the things um, throughout is, is Kobe's voice is um, either played out in Maxim's or, um, you know, one way or another. And one of the things he, he talks about, he goes to young athletes who commit to doing the hard work, the process always pays off. And, and it's, it's it particularly hardening um, after, you know, after Kobe's death and what, you know, all of us collectively remember about him and then, you know, celebrated at his, at his, um, at his wake mm -hmm. um, to hear his voice still resonate like that. And, it, and especially to inspire young people. Um, so if you don't mind, uh, can you hold on for a second? So we Absolutely. can uh, play a couple things and we'll be right back. Of course. Thanks. Thanks, Wesley. Coming up this week on Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. On Wednesday, Sports Stories will host the 90th AAU James E. Sullivan Award on Facebook Live at 5 p.m. That's Pacific Standard Time, so join us. On Thursday, Episode 3 of 4 with Jimmy Lennon Jr. drops on our YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. On Friday, Happy Hour Show, UCLA legend Keith Erickson and Toby Bailey will be on the show to discuss their memories of being part of the legendary Bruin basketball teams and the legendary coach, John Wooden. So we hope you join us for all of our amazing shows this week, and make sure you go subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on all our social media. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Christine here. I'm here. You can remember these three phrases. You can find us anywhere. The first, Sports Stories Podcast. The second, Sports Stories with Denny Lennon. That's Denny like the restaurant, Lennon like the beetle. Or Sports Stories DL. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, we're on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and of course here on Facebook. Like us, subscribe. If you had a podcast, we'd like you and we'd subscribe to you. Vámonos a Casa Blanca, vámonos a Casa Blanca, la comida para la familia. Vámonos a Casa Blanca, vámonos a Casa Blanca. All right. Hey, um, uh, next time you're coming through and, and, and you dock your, um, your, your yacht in the Marina del Rey, it's a small yacht Harbor. Um, let's go to Casablanca and grab, grab some margaritas and Mexican food. I would love that. Carlos will hook us up. I know he will. Um, another, uh, quote from Kobe glory lives in the process, not on the scoreboard. Love that. Um, and, and then the one that really kind of touched me was every human, is born to change the world. Unfortunately, some are changed by the world first. Um, I, I don't know if those are your words or his, but can you tell me a little bit about that? That's that's that seems to really hit a chord. 
Yeah, so I came up with all the proverbs, uh, but not all of them passed the Kobe test. <laughs> Certain ones um, didn't resonate with him. Certain ones were tweaked to reflect his values. He he loved the proverbs. Uh, that wasn't something we discussed. I had written the draft a few times, and then I thought, geez, it, you know, something was missing. I wanted some sort of summation of these values, and that's what these proverbs in it, and he loved them. Uh, which was great. And and that one was one that was never disputed, never talked about. We, we both like that. And it's perhaps less um, outwardly motivational than some of the other ones. Um, mm-hmm. But I like it because it reminds us a little bit uh, that we perhaps, even if we're one of those ones who have been changed, that we can change ourselves back. So um, the idea being that humans are inherently good, that we all have the, uh, the opportunity to affect positive change. These were fundamental values of Kobe's. Um, and that's one of the things he loved about kids' books is let's get these messages to kids. Um, let's teach them that they can do anything. Let's teach them to believe in themselves. And, and let's try and change them before the world can change them was sort of this this mission of this book. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so uh, maybe I heard this. Maybe I'm just speculating. It seems as though, did I hear that maybe you were planning on doing a six books or something along these lines, maybe one focusing on every player either in the starting lineup or on the roster or something, and that these players all represented somebody. So I heard you kind of talk a little bit how Reggie exemplified a lot of Kobe's behaviors, but Rain seems to be the one who was the most Kobe on the team. And then I'm wondering if if you don't mind, if you could identify maybe who the other players were. Yeah, so they didn't, um, I wouldn't say they're necessarily reflective of a real world person where, you know, to be, yes, uh, Kobe definitely really sort of first of all rain was this kobe-esque figure and yeah. what we sort of identified later was that um rain was maybe who kobe was becoming because uh rain's trajectory was becoming more of this leadership figure and, and whereas reggie was this early days kobe this guy who was grinding it out but i agree um you know and and we laughed about this sometimes you know because it's it's rain and, and one of rain's great challenges is is learning to use his teammates learning to facilitate the ball mm-hmm. learning to stop taking on the responsibility of everything and, and to sort of pass that around, which again is a sort of uh, um, Kobe S problem famously and, and again is being addressed in the last dance with Michael Jordan, which I was just watching episode four that just came out there. Um, but, you know, Rain had this really beautiful ending to his story. Um, and again, without spoiling it, but uh, his sort of the question that had been posed to him, because a lot of these guys face a question and, and Rollaby says, how does a leader open a door? And sort of the culmination of Rain's story is that a leader opens the door by holding it open for the rest of his team and stepping out of the way. And that was sort of his journey. So that was becoming this Kobe S part. Some of the other, you know, Twig represented me as a kid for sure, because I was this beanpole skinny kid uh, <laughs> who had no self-confidence. So all of it was being taken from certain um, areas and, uh, and, and from kids we met out on the road too. We both, of course, worked with kids and had met a million kids and we wanted to just try and reflect them as much as we could in the story. I just, um, I just, I just want to really encourage, especially parents that are listening, or just anybody who's like been a fan of basketball or team sports. It, it, it speaks to all of those, but you don't have to be to enjoy that, and for your, for your, um, you know, children to really get something out of it. So, no. so look, I, I mean, I have my ideas. I might think it's good, but I think it might be time to bring in a real journalist. Um, she's nine, if I'm not mistaken, maybe going on ten, um, and uh, her name's Alexandra Haro. And I'm going to bring her in. She's got a few questions for you, if you don't mind, Wesley. Hi, Alexandra. Oh, amazing, yes. Hello. Um, Hello Alexandra, we were, I was telling them that, you know, you're, you're on your game. We know you take care of business. And um, so I'd like to just throw it over to you, and, and you can ask the author, the New York Times bestselling author, a few questions. Okay. Uh, hello, Mr. King. It's Hi. a pleasure to meet you. Truly an honor. Um, I read the training camp book and I have an wow. assignment to ask the questions, but I have to answer them as if I was the author. However, I have the author right in front of me. So may I ask you some questions? That sounds great. Uh, my first question is, Kobe used to wake up at four o'clock to exercise. Did he wake you up at four o'clock to write the book? <laughs> You know, sometimes he did message me at hours that I was not normally awake at. Um, but he was such a excitable guy that he would just call you and be so 
ready, you know, probably because like you said, he was up at 4 a.m. running a marathon or something that he was just ready to go. So it started waking me up too. But yes, Kobe, um, Kobe didn't sleep much. That was one of his secrets. Uh, my next question is, <laughs> I know the main character, Rain, is like Kobe. And um, mm. the coach was from his former coach. Were there any other characters? Those that were based on on other players that Kobe played with, or you played with, by any chance? I, you know, I think so, and certainly uh, some of the ones about myself too. I, I sort of related to Twig and and Kobe. Um, he never quite specified who they. Maybe he was too um, diplomatic for that. But I'll tell you one quick story. We met. I met one boy in Philadelphia, and he was only eleven years old. So how old are you? I'm nine. Nine, okay. So 11 years old he was, and he was playing um, basketball at a high level. And he was getting yelled at by his coach, which was, you know, not very nice, of course. And so I came over when he was sitting, and I said, you know, why do you play basketball? How, how come you like, you know, do you like being yelled at? Why are you doing this? And this 11-year-old said, if you can believe this, he said, I have to play basketball because I have to get my family out of here. So he was taking this whole job of sort of providing for his family and so this is what a lot of young people do in certain parts where they're in sort of poorer areas. So we reflected a lot of that back in the story. And we wanted to write for some those types of readers as well. And so, um, you know, that team, for example, those 11 and 12 year old boys that were playing, uh, we wrote this story for those kind of kids who are in tough areas and to inspire them to, you know, keep pushing themselves out of it. That was a really good story. Um, my next question is, who is your favorite character in the book? Oh, that's a good question. I like them all for, for different reasons. But my favorite character um, is Reggie, who who is the star of season one. Uh, and I know he was sort of a side character within training camp, but we liked him so much that he got his own book. Um, and now we were about to write more books to come in, and hopefully we'll still have a chance to do so. Of course, it's going to be different. But um, Reggie was my favorite for sure. And my last question is, what did you learn from Kobe? Oh, my God, that's a great question. And I learned so much. Um, you know what I learned the most of all from Kobe? So when I thought of Kobe, I thought of this big basketball player, which he was. And uh, Kobe, of course, had everything going for him. But you know what he really thought was the most important thing in the entire world was his family. He was such a good dad. So I learned that no matter how much money you make, no matter how much celebrity you get, the most important thing in your life is your family. And that's what he taught me. That's a really good thing. Um, I really <laughs> like the book because like, it's like Harry Potter in basketball. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Alexandra, um, I wanted um, our guest Wesley to know that <clears throat> you've been on the show before and Wesley on the Wednesdays, we focus on high school athletes to Olympians, right? Mm. Alexandra is also, and her sister, they're filmmakers. And so she has this series called <laughs> Agent Zero, and um, where she says Agent Zero because, if, if I'm not mistaken, Alexandra, that was a number that you got for your youth basketball league, right? Yes. So she got that, and, and I think Gilbert Fantastic. Arenas also called himself Agent Zero when he played in the NBA. Right. And so Alexandra has two videos that we've already showed and, if, and so, Alexander, I was wondering if we can count on you for May 6th, so not tomorrow, not Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday, to debut Agent Zero 3. Ooh. Yeah, that's a possibility. Okay. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Wesley, can you, you, you're going you're gonna to like, you're going to like the Agent Zero series. It's solid. Solid. I, I, actually, I can't wait. I'm going to tune in. Yep. All right. So, uh, Alexandra, thanks for the questions. And, um, you know, what can I say? There's star in the making. Just it's happening. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Okay. Um, that's the best, right? That girl, she's on it. She's on, she's on her game. Awesome. That's great. She's on her game. Um, yeah, she puts us both I got, in. I know, right? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Alexandra. <laughs> Hit the road. Um, so I have some rapid fire questions. But before that, one Wait. of the things uh, I thought that would be appropriate here is to see a little video that was submitted from a 12-year-old girl that's working on her game. 
also uh, duly inspired by uh, your book and doing the work. And with the social distancing, it's a little bit more, you know, it's a little difficult to uh, get it done, but you'll see what she does in the middle of her street. And then, then we'll talk a little bit about it. So check this out. Okay. We're going to go full box and then we'll come back. Gal, uh, am I back in? Uh, that's Julia Galvan. Uh, out, she's obviously out this way, Los Angeles, sporting her Dodgers. So she's a 12-year-old sixth grader, and, and she's doing the work, huh? Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that's you love to see that. You know, um, her dad, Nick, was, was, was shooting that tape, and she knocked down that last jumper, and he didn't catch it. So I just got to say, on Julia's behalf, I get you. It's kind of frustrating when Pops can't even catch the, the last jumper that you hit to win the game. Typical, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, but, you know, that's that's my Nikki. All right. Um, <laughs> rapid fire question time. Are you prepared? It's easy. Ready. Okay. Um, what, was your, uh, what was your first pet's name? Rebel from Star Wars, um, based off Star Wars. Yeah. Nice. What kind, of, what, what kind of pet? Jack Russell Terrier. Aha. Uh -huh. um, favorite sports team growing up? Oh, sorry. Just cut off this there. Oh, what was your favorite sports team growing up? Favorite sports team growing up was the Toronto Maple Leafs. Okay. Um, did you have a nickname growing up? Yeah, actually, uh, Dirk, because I used to play very Dirk, Dirk. style basketball. Yeah, shooting threes. <laughs> 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 Sick. I was uh, back in the day. I, I people were calling me debt left shrimp for obvious reasons, not <laughs> basketball side of things. Um, how about uh, when you're growing up? Did you have a favorite board game? Yeah, same one as I do now. Risk. Oh, Risk. Yeah, nice. And, right. and um, how about favorite main dish now? Oh, that's a tough one. Favorite main dish now, same as it always was. Uh, goulash, German family. It's uh, my Oma's goulash. Nice. <laughs> okay. How about a uh, favorite dessert? Favorite dessert? Um, not a big, not a big dessert guy. But uh, I guess if it counts, and, and this was Kobe's design to me, the the Italian cream soda with the whipped cream on top. Mm. Those are. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. That was his go-to. Favorite uh, movie of all time. Favorite movie of all time. Uh, I still say Star Wars: A New Hope. That's the original. I'm a Star Wars guy. Fair enough. Um, do you have a favorite like musical group? Yeah, probably uh, you know a little obscure for most, but they're they're called Less Than Jake. It's like punk ska, but that's you know they've nice. been for the last fifteen years. So yeah, <laughs> the, the guy that um that does all my jingles and and silly voices, we used to call him Ska. He was into it for a while. He had to live. He had to live that. That was one of his nicknames. Um, how about um, I mean, not easy, but favorite author, favorite book. Oh, and, and that's a tough one. And, you know, there's so many, but, you know, I, we were both Harry Potter heads again, uh, but, but, you know, J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter mm -hmm. one, that was the guy that really got me into kids reading and writing when I was a teenager. And so I, I still put it up there. Nice. Um, favorite pro athlete all time. Dirk Nowitzki. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And then, um, uh, what's your go-to TikTok dance move? Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's for my 15-year-old show. Um, <laughs> what's your uh, favorite all-time quote? Oh, oh, okay. That's a tough one. Uh, my favorite all-time quote. <sighs> oh, see, I'm, I'm failing at this one, aren't I? Um, let's see. Jeez, I don't know. I, I, I'll have to, I'll get back to you on that one. I got, there's so okay. many. I'm, I'm a writer, so I'm thinking about quotes all day, but... <laughs> 
fair enough. And and then so on the west side of Los Angeles, mm. there's there's this these uncles in effect and and one father figure, and and they're the West Side Mexican Food Syndicate. That's what I like to call them. Okay, Tacos, La Cabana, Gilberts, and Casablanca. If you could only have one meal for the rest of your life, which of those four restaurants? La Cabana, Paco's, Gilbert's, or Casablanca? I'm going to say Gilbert's. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I mean, I, I keep an overall score on my website. <laughs> I think I should. Hey, um, congratulations. Uh, you're doing not only just good work, and um, but you're, you're moving people forward through your work. And and it's it's really important, the lessons that – that I, I think that, that are coming through in your books and congratulations. Thank you very much. You going to tune in uh, Wednesday night to see if uh, Sabrina takes it all. Go team Sabrina. I will. <laughs> nice. All right, Wesley. <laughs> thank you, buddy. All right. You too. Take care. We'll see you soon. Okay. That didn't suck, man. It's, it's really good. Uh, the, the wizard art books, they are, they're just really good. Like um, a lot, a lot of those books weren't my thing in terms of, I, I I preferred nonfiction books and or fictional reality kind of stuff, but um, that really hit home with me. And I think the lessons that can be learned there uh, for all are worth it. So I, I, I tell you, dive into it. It's a Wizard Art series, easy to search on Amazon and search out Wesley King. Um, he's a best-selling author for a reason. Okay, we got um, no VBC show tomorrow night. Let's take care of some. Uh, of our laundry. Uh, no VBC show tomorrow night. We need to run through in this beautiful studio so that we get Wednesday right. And Wednesday is the 90th AAU James E. Sullivan Awards. Are you kidding me? Bobby Jones all the way to Catherine Plummer. That's a lot of great athletes that have come through and taken that very prestigious award. Goes to the nation's top amateur athlete, irrespective of gender uh, um, and uh, any sport, right? And so we have Olympians, NCAA champions, it's 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 really going to be a, a great night. It's a great lineup. Ten of them will be uh, featured, interviewed, and then the winner presented at the end. So I hope you'll tune in. Um, we hope to break the internet that night. That would be fun. Okay, so that's five p.m. Uh, Pacific, eight p.m. Eastern. That's Wednesday, and then Friday. I think uh, it was already previewed, but that's going to be a good night. Keith Erickson, nineteen sixty four, nineteen sixty five. He played for Coach Wooden. Those were the first two titles under Coach Wooden. Toby Bailey, 1995, last Bruins team to win it. So they kind of book in all of those UCLA championships, although there's a big gap after Coach left for 20 years. Nonetheless, Toby's gonna, Toby can talk about what it was like to, to re-kickstart that. You know, Keith Erickson also played on an Olympic volleyball team. Coach Wooden called him the greatest athlete he ever had. Think of all the people that Coach Wooden had. So that, that's really going to be a fun night, and hopefully you'll be here Friday night for that. Okay? All right. Did I cover everything, Director Jimbo? I think so. By your official name. Uh, that, not quarantine that's that's life. my quarantine partner for life. Okay. I think we did cover everything. All right. Mm -hmm. Box Cobbler Entertainment, always. Let's do the roll. Later, peoples. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is supported by the AAU. Find a local event and join at aausports.org. And remember, you can catch your favorite amateur sports live stream, replays, and highlights at BallerTV.com. Sports Stories, along with East Bay, supports the Heroes Movement, a nonprofit that bridges the gap from mental or physical therapy to getting strong again through strength and conditioning workouts. This free service is available for any veteran of the United States Armed Forces. Visit HeroesMovementUSA.org for more information. Sports Stories, along with thousands of people across the country, also supports the My Stuff Bags Foundation, a nonprofit that provides traumatized children with new belongings and new hope. Learn more at MyStuffBags.org. Sports Stories with Denny Lennon is a production of Sports Stories, Inc. and is available on Apple Podcasts and YouTube or wherever you listen and watch. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and give us a review. It really helps spread the word. You can find all our social media links, archives, and other info on our website at sportsstoriespodcast.com. Special thanks to the John R. Wooden Course and Wooden's Wisdom. Original music for Sports Stories is courtesy of Lennon Music Productions. 
Original Images by Sienna Lennon Photography. Sports Stories is produced by Christine Jimbo and Marley Rice. Sports Stories is edited by Bob McCall. Additional staff include Ray Castro, Teresa Dolan, Jake Downey, Carlos Haro, and Buck Magic Lennon. Shout, shout, let it all out. Sports stories, what we're talking about. Come on, I'm talking to you. Come on, at five o'clock, Monday through Friday, yeah. They're on the clock. Sports Stories gonna tell you what it's all about With distinguished stars And people that you need to hear about So shout, shout, let it all out Sports Stories is what I'm talking about Come on, I'm talking to you Come on See you next week. <laughs>